Tonight we're in Joshua chapter 1. If you guys go to the Old Testament book of Joshua, if you want help to get to the book of Joshua, start at the beginning of the Bible, go through from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy, and guess what's coming up next? It's Joshua. So if you go to Joshua chapter 1, we're going to be looking at the first nine verses of Joshua chapter 1. Chapter, there's 24 chapters in Joshua. It's a big book. And so don't, don't get weary on me right now. You're like, man, this guy's going to take us for five years here. No, I'm not. Uh, you're going to see as, I, as we go through here, there's some chapters that I'm going to actually take as a whole and kind of give you an aerial shot of that chapter and pull out the application from those chapters. Uh, but tonight, we are kind of starting off on a slow pace. Uh, so verses 1 through 9, I'll read these first uh, nine verses, and then we'll get into our study. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that it says that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am given to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory." No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, and that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go." People hate change, so I hear. When it comes to life changes, a lot of us probably kind of freak out when it comes to big changes. But the change we generally resist is the kind of change that we think will make our situation worse rather than better. Uh, we eagerly change jobs for more pay or more influence. Perhaps we buy a bigger house and move to a better neighborhood. So when you really look at this and you really think about it, we, are happily, we happily move to those areas or we change in that way. So it's not change that we generally hate. It's not that kind of change. What we hate, it's the change that involves loss, whether it's physical, emotional, sometimes even psychological. When, when change comes in our lives, and you gotta, if, you've, if you've lived life long enough, which most of you have, you know that change is both ine inevitable and necessary. If everything stays the same, no one is growing. No one is moving forward. No, there's no change. There's no moving ahead. If everything stays the same in our lives. And I find it interesting because when it comes to change, whether it's the loss of a job, a start of a new career, a serious illness, a financial setback, moving to a new city, becoming a parent, getting married, or even a retirement, you realize that there's always challenges to those changes. You know, when you open up the Bible and you begin to read the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, it is not very hard to miss the, the people that God used, whether they're men, women, married couples. You see that God did amazing things in their lives, and there are many transitions that take place in the lives of the people in the Bible. I, for example, if you want to kind of take it from the beginning, Adam and Eve. Imagine Adam and Eve, our first parents, they were the very first couple that experienced a huge transition in their lives. They went from paradise to a fallen world. Could you imagine the transition that they experienced? Here they are in paradise. They're in a place called the Garden of Eden. There's no sin. There's nothing going on in there that, that, that is sinful or whatnot. It's a, it was a great place. And all of a sudden, they disobeyed God. So they went from paradise to a fallen world. The moment they crossed over to this place of, of a fallen world, they began to suffer. They began to sweat. They began to feel pain. 
And so could you imagine going from a place where there is no pain, a place where everything was sinless, to a place where now sin entered the human race? I, can't, I mean, we're living on this side of, of the paradise. We understand what pain is like. We know what corruption is like, right? We turn on the television, we see what's going on in our world. See, Adam and Eve actually experience none of that stuff when they were in paradise, but then they came on over to our end, and now they began to experience a fallen world. They were the first couple to experience a major life transition. But that is, as you go on in the Bible, you see Abraham experienced transition. He, he left, God says, leave your father's co uh, country and go to a place that I will show you. Remember that? And so Abraham experienced transition. Moses experienced transition. When he went back, he left, Midi or he left Egypt, went out into the Midian Desert. We'll talk a little bit about Moses in a moment. And then God called him to go back to Egypt. What a transition that was. And then as you continue to read throughout the Bible, you have David, a little shepherd boy. All of a sudden, God says, you're done shepherding sheep. You're going to now be the king in Israel. Imagine that kind of life change. And then not only that, but as you go into the New Testament, you have the disciples who went from fishers of fish to fishers of men. A big transition, big change in their lives, right? And then not only that, but they experienced another transition. When Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead, and they saw him ascend back into heaven. And Jesus says, okay, you guys are on your own now. Wait a minute, we've been with you for a long time, for three or so years, and now we're alone. What a kind of transition was that? And you read throughout the Bible, I'm just giving you a few examples there, but as you go through the Bible, you're going to come up to a lot of people in Scripture that God did some interesting work in their lives, and they experienced transition and change in life. One of the things that we have to see as we look, go through this book here is that every major change brings a challenge. You cannot escape that. And, and we see here that as we look into the book of Joshua, as we enter into this book, we are going to see probably one of the biggest transition in, in the history of humankind. And that is the children of Israel finally entering into a promised land. They got promised Abraham. It's a promise that God kept. And here is Joshua. Moses' assistant, Moses becomes, or Joshua becomes Moses' successor. And now he takes the baton and takes the children of Israel into the promised land. You see, when it comes to the children of Israel, I say that the children of Israel, I would say that they have, they're, they're the ones that experience the most transition in their personal lives as, 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 a, as a nation, as a group of people. They were in constant transition over and over and over and over and over. It wasn't anything new to them. When it comes to the book of Joshua, we're going to be looking at this, and we're going to start off with these nine verses by looking at these things. But when it comes to the book of Joshua here, usually the book of Joshua is recommended to read whenever we find ourselves in transition. When somebody's going through a transition, I say, hey, listen, dive into the book of Joshua. There's a lot of wisdom there when it comes to transition. When it comes to life changes and how to go about it and all that, the book of Joshua is a great book. And it's interesting because this book has been very instrumental in my personal life because I've gone through a lot of transition in my personal life, and, and I'm going to continue to go through transitions. So this book's going to be right there with me when that happens again. And so when we look at this, we see that this book is filled. It's, it's rich with all kinds of wisdom when it comes to transition in life. And so what happened here? Well, after 40 years of wandering and setbacks, God's people were ready to enter the promised land. Moses, their great leader, had died, and Joshua, his assistant, is now in charge. This is not a small job. This is going to be huge, as you're going to see here in a moment. It was a major transition in the life of Joshua to go from being an assistant to the main leader of the children of Israel. What was his job? His job was to cross over into the land of milk and honey, flowing with milk and honey. In fact, our theme of this entire book is crossing over. You know what the cool thing about this is that perhaps you're here tonight and you're probably kind of on the verge of a transition in your personal life. Maybe you're experiencing that right now. And you're sitting here, you're like, oh man, are you serious? This guy's going to talk about this? I'm like, right there, right now. Good. You're going to get some wisdom. 
Or perhaps you're like, what are you talking about? There's 24 chapters in this book. I guarantee you, a lot of you are going to go through some transition in the next six, seven months, probably, however long it's going to take us. It's one of those books that, that speaks to everybody's heart. And so we see here that one of the, the biggest lesson, if I were to give you the lesson that you have to keep in mind as we're going through this entire book, because this is a recurring lesson you're going to see throughout this 20, these 24 chapters. And the lesson is this, and you want to write this down somewhere in your Bible. God is always faithful in every change. God is always faithful in every change. It doesn't matter what you're going through, what change is happening in your life. Listen, God is always faithful in every change. That is going to be a recurring lesson throughout these 24 chapters of Joshua. Tuck that away somewhere. Put it around, around the Bible somewhere, around these scriptures, because I guarantee you, you're going to see this over and over in the life of Joshua. The book of Joshua is a very powerful book. It's actually part of the historical books of the Old Testament. Uh, after Joshua wrote this book, or not Joshua, but as, as some believe, it was penned by different people. But, but we see, though, that before Joshua, we have five books, what we call them the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch in the Greek, the Torah in the Hebrew. And, and these books here are the historical books as we get into the book of Joshua. Uh, the book of the, the, the books of Moses, or the five books of Moses, as they say, they tell the story of Israel's first entry into the promised land under Joshua, as you see here. It also tells the story of Israel's life in the land under the judges and the transition to kingship, the division of the nation into two rival kingdoms, the southern kingdom, the, the northern kingdom, the downfall and exile of each kingdom, the life in the exile, and Judah's return from exile. All of that stuff you get in these historical books. These books span close to a thousand years of history. A thousand years of history. So it's not surprising that, that their history includes many ups and downs, twists and turns. Yet through it all, God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And he remains the focal point of their lives. Kind of reminds me of life on this side of heaven. There's going to be ups and downs, twists and turns, right? I mean, we all experience that. Yet through it all, through it all, God is always faithful. He remains faithful in those changes, like I mentioned before. And not only that, but God remains the focal point of our lives if we allow him to be. Keeping him first. You see, I see that, I, I, I look at life like this. Life is a great adventure. It really is. But when you bring God in the picture, when you put God in the middle of your life, life becomes very exciting on top of that adventure. And God has ways to move us around. God has ways to speak to our hearts. And so we see here that Joshua had God at the center of his life. And God made it very clear in these first nine verses that God wanted to be the center or the focal point in his life. So what happened to Moses? Why did he die well, we're going to get into that here right now. Let's look at verses 1 and 2, the call of Joshua. The call of Joshua. Now, we're going to be turning into other verses, too. Uh, so just keep that in mind. He says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. He starts off, after the death of Moses. This is significant. And for, for, for more than four decades, if you remember, for more than four decades, this great leader, this lawgiver, the servant and friend of God, led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He had a big job there. Through the desert, everyone alive knew only one leader, Moses. That was the only leader they knew. But Moses got himself in big trouble. He got himself in big trouble. And I'm going to show you real quickly what happened. Go to Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Turn to Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Just go to your left. After Deuteronomy, go to Numbers chapter 20 at verse 8. I want to kind of give you the story here real quickly of what happened to Moses. If you're wondering, well, why did Moses die? What did he do? Verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 8. This is where we begin with the story of Moses. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you, your brother Aaron, a Gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus, you shall bring water to them, or for them, out of the rock. 
and give drink to the congregation and, these, and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Nice way to talk to your church, huh? Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Notice what happens in verse 12. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. What did Moses do that warranted such a severe penalty from the Lord? I mean, you, you look at God, you're like, okay, I've blown it many times. I've blown it. And God has never said to me, oh, sorry, you can't get to heaven now. You're done. You blew it, right? And you're thinking, well, why would God do that to him? I mean, it was a mistake. Okay, so he got a little upset at the people, right? Have you ever been upset at people, right? Have you ever said dumb things to people, right? You're like, oh, man, I can't believe I said that to them. And you go to God and say, Lord, I'm so sorry for what I said. I know this was not good. It wasn't right. And God doesn't say, well, too bad. I won't forgive you, right? He forgives you. So what happened here? Why did Moses get this huge punishment? There's four reasons I want to give you, quick ones. First, Moses disobeyed a direct command of God. That's why God did this. God made it very clear to Moses this is what you're supposed to do. Speak to the rock. A direct command. Moses disobeyed God. Now you wonder why God went after Jonah. Wasn't there a direct command given to Jonah? Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Nope. I mean, how do you feel when your kids say that to you? Hey, son, take out the trash. No way. I mean, do you, what do you do? Do you get like, all right, fine, tomorrow do it then. No, you go, excuse me? You just, I just gave you a direct command to take out the trash. You don't say no to me. How, who are you, right? Well, God is a father, right? And God's saying to Moses, uh, excuse me? I said to you, speak. I didn't say hit the rock. And so it was a direct uh, a disobedience to direct command of God. The second reason why this was very severe is because Moses took credit for bringing forth the water. You're like, really? How did that happen? Well, notice in verse 10 of Numbers, Moses says, must we, referring to Moses and Aaron, bring you water out of this rock? Ooh, what do you mean? It's not your doing, Moses. It's not your doing. This is God doing this through you. And so there's another violation. Third, Moses and Aaron lack trust in God, which is reflected in the fact that God pointed it out to them when he says, because you did not trust in me enough. Numbers 20, verse 12. Because you did not trust me. And fourth, Moses basically misrepresented God. He totally misrepresented God. He became very angry. He was very harsh to the people. And even though God knew that the children of Israel had some issues, right? They were very, very um, glitchy, if you will, I guess, right? They were very, they were complainers, murmurers, and all of that. God still loved them. And so Moses had no right to represent God as an angry God. Rebels. And so right there we see that God said to Moses, because of this, you're not entering into the promised land. In other words, you're not going to step foot in there with the children of Israel. You see, what we see here is very interesting. What I see here is that God's promise to Abraham was in no way altered by the death of Moses. Because could you imagine God could have said to Moses, Oh, what are you doing out? I can't allow you to go into the promised land. Therefore, my plans that I had for the children of Israel are now have been squashed. Thanks, Moses. It didn't happen that way. God says, Moses, I'm not using you. I'm going to use somebody else. And so God tells Moses very clearly, you're not going to be taking them in. And so what does Moses do? Well, Moses prays, God, okay, then who do you want to use to be basically my successor? Who is the one who's going to take the children of Israel into the promised land? 
Notice that God prayed. He went to God and asked, God, who are you going to send? It wasn't that Moses said to God, I have an idea, God. I know who can go before me. No, it was, God, who are you going to send? Who are you going to use? Well, that's when God told Moses, Joshua. Joshua is the one who is going to take over your position. He is the one who is going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Joshua was around for a while, actually. Joshua wasn't a newbie. I mean, Joshua was actually mentored under Moses for about 40 years or so. Even, Mo even Joshua says that during the time that he, was being, uh, that he was with Moses as his assistant, he was around 40 years old. And so as Moses was there and Joshua was there for about 40 years before the leadership transition took place, we see that, God, or that Moses was actually mentoring Joshua. Joshua was a big part of this entire congregation. You know, later on, God tells Moses to lay hands on Joshua. And you see that in Numbers chapter 27. And he lays hands on Joshua in front of the congregation before Moses died. Why? Because God wanted to make sure while Moses was still alive that the people of Israel understood clearly that it was Joshua who's going to take over the leadership of Moses. It wouldn't have happened if Moses died. If Moses died, the children of Israel could have easily rebelled against Joshua because they would have said, well, how do we know Moses put you in charge? Moses never said anything to us. But God was very cool about it. He was very wise because then he said, okay, I'm gonna, I want you to lay hands on him in front of the congregation so everybody knows while you're alive that you know that he is going to be the guy who's going to take over. And then Moses dies and the children of Israel already knew that Joshua was the one who was going to take over. And so we see here very clearly that the final scene of that last chapter of Moses, if you guys turn to Deuteronomy 34, I want you guys to read this with me real quickly, just right next to, right over Joshua to the left. The final scene, it's kind of a sad scene, Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 8. Listen to this. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the west, western sea, the south and in the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as, for Zoar, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Isn't that kind of, kind of sad? So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he was buried in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite of Bet Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor was di uh, diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Moses died. It's a done deal. It's over. And we come to Joshua chapter 1, and God says, Now that my servant Moses is dead. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? 120 years old. And, the, and, and it even says there that Moses wasn't, his eyes weren't dim. He still had plenty of stamina. In other words, he could have gone another 100 years past that, another 50 years. He didn't die because it was, because he was too old to, to, to lead the children of Israel. He died because he wasn't going to continue on with the children of Israel. Now, it's interesting that we go in the book of Jude, we see that there's a battle going on in heaven. Michael the archangel with the enemy fighting over the body of Moses. What does that mean? I don't know. Just thought I'd tell you that. <laughs> it's interesting, too, the transfiguration, the mountain of transfiguration, when Jesus takes his disciples on this mountain, there are two people with, with Jesus, Elijah and Moses. Elijah, who did not taste death, was taken up, and Moses. It's interesting. I don't know what, what's going on there, but we know for sure that L Moses represents the law. Jo uh, Elijah represents the prophets. And so 
There's a mystery there. And I know Bible scholars have gone all over the place trying to figure out what happened here. What's going on here? And then a lot of scholars will take that and say, okay, now we go to Revelation chapter 11. And those two witnesses have to be Moses and Elijah because they have to taste death. If, if Moses, something happened to him and he got into, he, you know, the, the body was somewhere and, you know, never made it to heaven or whatever. They're the ones that are coming back and they're the ones that are going to complete what they left here on earth. But we don't know that. That's all speculation. That's probably be a question you're going to ask me at the end of the month. So it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Wow, I love that word. The Lord spoke to Joshua. God had already chosen Joshua as Moses' successor. And so Joshua knew his calling. So in other words, what this means is the 30 days were done of mourning. Now God allowed them to mourn. Now it's time to move on. Now it's time to... Get going. And that's why God comes to Joshua. He speaks to Joshua. And it's interesting that as he comes here, Joshua was probably around 68 to 70 years old. A lot of Bible scholars have done their numbers. Some even said he could have been about 80 years old. You know, perhaps closer to 70, maybe 80. It shows you. I mean, could you imagine, you know, an 80-year-old taking over the ministry here of Moses? You know, I mean, nowadays we're looking for younger people, right, to take over churches, right? A pastor that's going to leave their church, he's not going to look for an 80-year-old to come over and say, okay, here's your new pastor. Thank you. Right? <laughs> no offense to those who are older here. God still can use you. But you know, you, you're trying, you know my point right here, right? You get my point here, right? I mean, please. God's like, really, Robert? I, you don't think I can use an 80-year-old? I, I know you can, Lord. I know you can. Different culture, different society, right? But the Lord spoke to Joshua. Here's Joshua, perhaps pushing 70, pushing 80. And here he's taking over this leadership position. And it's important for us to note that it was God who called Joshua. It wasn't Joshua saying to God, Lord, now that Moses, or Moses is dead, can I do this? Can I take over his position? It wasn't like that. God called Joshua. And it's cool to see that because it's important because even today, you know, there are things where, you know, pastors will look at, at classified ads and they try to pick and choose where to go and pastor a church or whatnot. I, I know God can use that, but sometimes I'm like, you know what, you really have to be called by the Lord to go somewhere, to do something. And I think this is a great example to see that it was God who called Joshua. God did not put an ad in the paper and say, I'm looking for somebody to take over two, two million Jews across the desert. You know, call, no calls, just send your resume or whatever, right? It wasn't like that. It's like, no, I'm going to choose Joshua. Could you imagine how Joshua must have felt when, when, when God said, Moses, Joshua is the one who's going to take over your position, and then he lays hands on Joshua. Imagine Joshua wondering, like, whoa, this is huge. I mean, this is going to be incredible. And then Moses is still alive, and then Moses dies, 120, and there's 30 days of mourning. And could you imagine what went on in, in Joshua's head? What was going on in his heart? He's like, oh, man, he's dead. Now it's my turn. What, what's going on here, right? You're going to see that perhaps there was some fear in him because of what God says to him here in the first six verses. That did Joshua, like anybody, was, prob was probably freaking out. I mean, this is, guys, this is a mega church here. This is the biggest church recorded in the Bible. About two million Jewish people were right there looking to Joshua to lead them into the promised land. How intimidating would that be to you? That's crazy, isn't it? And so here God comes to Joshua and says, okay, Joshua, arise and go. It's time to go. 30 days are up. Moses is dead. Let's do this. Whoa. Whoa. This is not something light, right? This is not something that you're like, oh, this is going to be great. I can't wait, right? No, this is interesting because notice that I bet you that here, Elijah felt very, or I'm sorry, uh, Joshua felt very, very intimidated by this entire process. But it's interesting to me that God had to move Moses out of the way. Now, Joshua could have stepped in while Moses was still alive, but there were some issues with that. I think when we look at this here, actually, 
we see very clearly that even though Joshua was a very strong military leader, because that's what he was when he was with, with Moses, um, we see that Joshua here was very timid by this whole thing. And so as we see here that Joshua is ready to take this position here, we see very clearly that God had to move Moses out of the way. And I'll give you some reasons here in a moment. Joshua was a very faithful man of God. In fact, he was one of the 12 spies that were sent to spy out the land. When they all went in there, 10 of the people that went over with them came back scared to death because there were giants in the land. He said they were like gigantic grasshoppers, they said. They're like, these are huge people. There's no way we can beat these guys. And it was Joshua and Caleb, the only two out of the 12, that stood up and said, no, 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 we're not going to be afraid. God promised the land. We can do this. God is going to give us the victory. Let's do this. He was the only one with Caleb out of those 12 out of the 10 there that actually had the courage to say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to be afraid. The only people that made it to the promised land was Joshua and Caleb and the children of the first generation. Their parents didn't make it. Isn't that crazy? Those guys just stayed in the wilderness and died there. It was their kids and Joshua and Caleb were the ones that stepped over, and they were the ones that came in. Now, you wonder, well, what about Aaron? Well, Aaron died. He died at 123 years old. That's a long time, huh? 123 years. That's a long, long time. But he died, and he was part of the mess that Moses got himself into. So, so God wasn't going to use Aaron because you would think, okay, there's Moses, and, and I thought Aaron was his right-hand man. He was but he was part of the whole thing. So God says, I'm not using you guys. We're going to go with somebody new. And, and because Joshua was right there already coming underneath Moses with his military expertise, God did not call Joshua to be a military general. He called him to be the one to lead them over to the, to, to, to the promised land. He wasn't looking for a military general like he, what he was. And so here we see that we see here that his dad's name is Nun. He says the son of Nun, not of a nun, but Nun. And we don't know much about his father, except for what we have here. We can look at other places in Scripture, but there's not much more about his father. But the cool thing is, if I mean, imagine this dad, Mr. Nunn, I guess, if you will. I mean, he had a son that, that took over this position. I mean, could you imagine being the dad of, a, of your son? And your son's like, yeah, dad, I'm going to take over this church that's about 2 million people. I mean, could you imagine? It's a dad like, good job, son, do it, you know? I mean, that's pretty big. And so he's the son of Nun. And yet here we see here that the name Joshua, just to throw this out to you so you kind of have this, uh, the Greek name Jesus simply translates the Hebrew name Joshua. The names are identical. They both mean salvation. So there's a, there's a spiritual component to this that I'm going to share with you here in a moment. But he says in verse 2, my servant Moses is dead. I love that. God says, my servant Moses, not my boy, not my man, my servant. The word servant in the Hebrew just means minister. My servant, my minister Moses is dead. I want to circle back around to what I said earlier, that God had to move Moses out of the way for Joshua to effectively take over his leadership. God didn't allow Moses to be around. Why? Well, here's where some commentators kind of begin to kind of look at the picture from a spiritual perspective. We're not told the reason why here, but it's interesting that there's an observation that's made that, that they say Moses represents the law, Joshua being a type of Christ's. So the law was never intended to bring total forgiveness of sins. We actually went through the book of Hebrews talking about that. It pointed us to Jesus, to Christ, who is the one who leads us to victory and to the promised land. And so Joshua's name, which is so clearly, um, you know, focused on, you know, meaning Jesus, salvation or whatnot, reminds us that Yahweh is salvation. And so Moses, representing the law, would not take us into the promised land. But Joshua, being the type of Christ, as Christ came full of grace, that's what gets us into the promised land. So there's a spiritual component to it. It's an observation. This is a speculation. 
Uh, you, you'll find this in commentaries and all. But, but, but I think on a practical level, if you want to look at it from a practical perspective, I would say that it would have been very difficult for Joshua to freely lead Moses while Moses was still alive. Because remember, the only leader that pe the people knew was Moses. And so if Moses was still alive and Joshua was here, it could have been some confusion there. It would have been a little difficult on a practical level. John Wesley said this, and I quote, God buries his workmen, but his work goes on. And I think that's true. You know, listen, God uses men, and God uses them in a powerful way, but God doesn't get stuck on that. Because then God says, listen, I want to continue my work. And so he raises up other people to move forward with the work. And so we see this exactly, this happening here with Joshua. That yes, I respect Moses. He's my servant. He's dead. But listen, Joshua, it's time for you to rise and go. My work is not complete is what, what we see here. And that's what he says there. Arise and go. This is a command, not an option. Go. Again, Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh. And he said, no. There are important lessons here for all of us when it comes to the Christian life that I want to kind of go through here. The Christian life involves obedience to the Word of God. I think that's pretty practical. I think a lot of you guys here know that. It is a life to be lived by faith in the power of God. And it's interesting because we simply cannot live the Christian life in our own power or by our own determination. We have to let God lead us. We have to bring God into the equation, if you will. We don't tell God what we want to do. There's a determined will, uh, determined will by God to do something in our lives. And then what our job is to try to figure that out through prayer, through the word and whatnot. And so sometimes we think as Christians that when we become Christians, that now God can, can do everything that I've been wanting to do. Okay, God, and he's like, kind of like a genie, right? You rub the lamp and he says, he pops out and you're like, okay, this is what I want to do in life. So get at it, God. Get me going on this. That's not the way it is. The Christian life is not either not about just being Mr. Nice Guy either. It's not about being nice or, 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 Christ, or you know, uh, keeping set of Christian principles and, and rules and whatnot. The Christian life is a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a relationship that we're to live out in the power of the Holy Spirit in light of the Word of God. God is giving Joshua the go to move forward now that Moses is dead. This was a step of faith. It was time to bring God's people to the promised land. There are times, and there will be times, when God will tell us to go. It's time to move on. It's time to move forward. I have more for you. And we go by faith. We go trusting God, and we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. So with the words arise and go here in this text, the Lord is saying to Joshua, get out of the desert and go into the, and go into the promised land. Go to Canaan where the promised land is at. The adventure of Joshua is about to begin here. And before God dispatches Joshua, he begins to encourage him. He tells him very clearly here in Joshua chapter 1, notice in verse 2. He says, arise, go over to the Jordan you and all this people to the land which I am given to them. I am giving to them, the children of Israel. This is about God. This is not about Joshua. It's not about Joshua at all. This is about the promise of God that he made that promise to, to Abraham. God has a plan, and he's using Joshua to bring about his plan. Joshua is just that instrument that God says, I'm going to use you, Joshua. This is not about you. It's about my promise, the promise I made to my people. I'm choosing you to be that instrument to lead them into the promised land. You know, when it comes to being used by God, it is not only a serious thing, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be used by God. It's serious, but it's an incredible privilege. Joshua is being used by God in a powerful way. And man, what a privilege it was for Joshua. And God used a lot of men in the Bible. Moses, Abraham, David, Jeremiah, Jonah, the 12 disciples. And man, it was a work that God called them to do, but it was God's work. It wasn't their work. And God just used them as the instruments to further God's kingdom. And so what God will do here is that now God will give Joshua three things that he needed to know about his calling. We're going to go, we're going to speed through these, okay? 
The first thing we see here in verse 3, he says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I have to Moses. Three things, Joshua, that you need to know about your calling. One is that your call is going to take, it's going to require taking steps of faith. Listen, the land, the promised land is not just going to fall on your lap. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to go get it. That takes steps of faith. He says every place. It's an adventure of faith. It's not just going to fall on your lap. A step by step, God will lead Joshua into the promised land. Let me say something about faith. Faith is action, guys. Faith is action. Faith is movement. Faith is activity. When we look at faith, the Christian life is a life of faith. You know, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, listen to this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. There's action. There's movement there, right? Which God prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them, right? It doesn't say that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to sit on our hands. We're created for something, for good works, that God is preparing beforehand so that we should walk through them or walk in them. In other words, right now, there are works and things that God is doing in your life, and you are going to be walking into those works that God is preparing for you. He's preparing them already, and he's going to get you from A to B, and he has ways to do it, unless you're a Jonah and say no. And the cool thing about that is that it shows us that the Christian life is an, uh, it's a life of action. We're, we're, as Christians, we're to be active within our faith. We don't just get saved and sit on the side and say, okay, well, I'll we'll just wait till I get to heaven. No way. Then, then, then it's going to be boring. And Christians will say, well, oh, Christian life is boring. No, you're boring, not God. God is not boring. When you look at the Bible, I mean, you read it, and you're like, man, God is a God of action here. How, do, how can I get involved here? How can I get into the plan here? Well, we have to trust the Lord and walk by faith, as the Bible says, not by sight. God is encouraging Joshua to move forward. The land is theirs, ready to take, but Joshua needed to start moving in faith as God comforts him there in verse 3. He's going to take those steps of faith, as you're going to see here as we go through the book of Joshua here. And God is calling him to a specific task, and he's promising Joshua right away victory. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's promising victory right away. You know, sometimes we stop moving forward because there's opposition or because there's obstacles in the way, and sometimes we'll even conclude it must not be God if there's so much going on. No, 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 that's not true. I mean, you're going to see here that even though we're reading these first nine verses, as we get into this book, there's going to be a lot of opposition and obstacles in the way here to enter that land. And, and it's interesting because taking the land took effort. The challenge ahead was not for those content with Egypt, but for those who would press ahead for what God had called them to. Because remember, there was one point where the children of Israel said, Let's go back to Egypt. We had it better there. Leeks, onions, and all that. Remember that? They were liars. <laughs> Romanticizing the past is really bad sometimes. Christians do this a lot. Oh, you know what? I had it better before I was a Christian. You know, my friends did not bother me. I didn't have all these temptations. You know what? It was better back then. Oh, really? Being a meth addict was best? Oh, really? Okay, so, 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 so life before Jesus was better. See, when you romanticize the past, there's something wrong. And the children of Israel did that because Egypt equaled slavery, bondage, torture. And for them to even say we had it better in Egypt was a lie. They were deluded. And so when you say to other people, I had it better before I was a Christian because of all this, listen, there's something wrong. You did not have it better before you were a Christian. In fact, life is better being a Christian. Yeah, there are ups and downs. I understand that. Yes, there are challenges. There are temptations. But listen, I've had more good times with Jesus than bad times with Jesus in my walk with him. I'm serious. I'm not just saying this. And I hope that you would do the same thing. I hope you understand that, that you get off of that trip sometimes that you think you had it better before you were a Christian. That's a lie. Romanticizing the past is bad. It took effort for him to take the, 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 the actual um, the land when Nehemiah was called by God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he took that step of faith to do it. And guess what met him 
on the way, Sambalat and Tobias, these two jerks, sorry. <laughs> they were, read it. These guys were bad. Man, these guys kept throwing discouragement to these guys. He was discouraging those on the wall. And so did Nehemiah say, oh, maybe the Lord's not in it because there's a Sambalat and Tobias, so we're going to go back. God, I'm sorry, God, I, I guess I thought you were. No, no. He says, I know what God has called me to do. I'm going to press on. And he did, and he built the walls of Jerusalem, and Joshua's going to experience that as well. And so what we see here is very clear, is that in the Christian life, just because we're in Christ, saved, redeemed, doesn't mean that our lives will be without testing, conflict, struggles, and challenges. You're going to get those things. However, let me say this, with God, because God is not, he's not against us, he's for us, we will experience deliverance through faith in all of those situations. That is what Joshua will experience. The second thing he gives him here about his calling, there's some boundaries. In verse 4, God lays out the territory. Joshua had to know the boundaries. It was a real land, and, and God did not want Joshua to be out in left field somewhere else wondering, is this where God wants us? No, he made it clear, this is your boundaries. The third thing that he, he gave him about his calling is that God's everlasting presence was going to be with him. I love this. Verse 5, he says, I will be with you. That's enough for anyone seeking God's will, isn't it? I will be with you. Victory is assured not because Joshua was a good military uh, person, not because he was a good leader, but because God is a great God and God was going to be with him. That's where victory came. When God calls you and I to do something, you can be assured that his presence will be with you. And Joshua was there when Moses looked up to heaven and said to God this in Exodus 33, 15. He says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Do you know how many times I've prayed that? And do you know how many times I continue to pray that? Lord, if you are not going with me, if your presence, if your blessing is not here, if this is not where I'm supposed to be, then Lord, please do not send me. Please don't let me go. It's a, it's a very common prayer for me, to be honest with you. Why? Because I want to be where God wants me to be. Do you want to be where God wants you to be? Are you where God wants you to be? You got to be honest with God. Lord, Am I in the right place? Am I in the right position? Am I in the right job? Am I in the right relationship? We have to ask that. We have to be honest with God. I don't want to be anywhere without the presence of God. Now, when I say that, I know, we know in the New Testament, God never leaves us nor forsakes us. But what I'm trying to say, what I'm meaning when I say that, is that I don't want to be anywhere that God has not called me. That's what I'm saying. And that's was what Moses was trying to make sure with God. That can be a job, like I said, it could be a relationship, a situation that you have no business being in. I'm going to close here with a few thoughts. I'm, I'm actually stopping very early because we've got to, do, we've got to partake in communion. So I'm going to continue on with this, but I want to close with my application that I can still kind of integrate here in my study. Joshua's task was pretty big. You're going to see it here as we go through this book. But I, but I don't want you to miss some lessons here that I think are very important for us to consider. And, and, and I want you to understand one thing here, and perhaps some of you here may be going through a lot lately. You're going through a lot lately in your life, or you're currently in a situation that is over your head. You're, it's over your head. And you're asking the question, what do I do? How do I move forward from this? Well, let me say this to you. Knowing that you are not alone should give you the courage to press on. Notice in verse 9, it says it there. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Maybe the Lord just spoke to your heart right now. He just confirmed. He just comforted your heart. Listen, press on. Don't be afraid. Maybe God has been asking you to take a, a huge step into a deeper faith or to serve beyond what you think you're capable. Well, listen, God is aware of your fears. God is aware of your fears. 
If God is calling you into a deeper faith with Jesus, go for it. Don't be afraid. Go for it. If that means that you'll be going through a transition in life, so be it. Trust Jesus. But I'll leave you this final thought. Not all change is pleasant. We've established that. But when you're being led to a better place by God who loves you, we don't need to fear. All he wants is for you to trust him. He'll work out the details. Don't worry about it. Don't go ahead of the Lord. He will walk you step by step. Amen?